And for many film fans of all ages, the legendary figure created by Boris Karloff is indeed still very much alive. It is 20 years now since he died, and most of his 150 films are still being shown all over the world. It is 60 years since the release of the classic Frankenstein film, which made Boris Karloff an international star. I personally had the great good fortune to know Boris quite well. And I was able, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but it's nonetheless true, to get to know the man behind the mask, the man behind the legend. I think that in this documentary, we shall probably surprise you with a great number of facts um, which lie behind Boris's long life and long career, which have never been revealed before. Of course, the full range of his work was by no means remotely confined to the playing of one particular character or, or indeed in one particular kind of film. He was an actor of enormous range, enormous power, which is so important these days, as Chekhov himself said, gunpowder. Uh, very few of our actors possess that these days, but Boris certainly had it. Uh, an actor of enormous range and power, as I've already said, and great versatility. He was not by any means confined to what are loosely termed horror films. And uh, there's a, an enormous body of work, silent films, black and white films, and then color, of course, which Boris was involved in, which doesn't come under any specific heading. I mean, he was equally at home in comedy and in what is known as straight drama, as in melodrama, as indeed the uh, somewhat gruesome films in which he did appear from time to time. And of course, he had a very distinguished career in television and a very distinguished career in the theater and an enormous amount of radio. I don't particularly like the phrase Renaissance man because it's been used so many times, it's become a cliche, but I think that Boris really was uh, the closest thing that I've known over a great many years to that particular sort of person. I myself, at one time in my life and career, uh, was a singer, and uh, I have appeared in various countries in operatic performances. Imagine my surprise and delight when I first saw Boris singing on the screen, and he had a very good voice indeed, which sounded to me like a trained voice. And of course, he had the opportunity of showing the world in person, not just on the screen, but in front of an audience over a very long period of time, that he did possess a fine singing voice, which he used in the unforgettable um, show on Broadway of Peter Pan. I need hardly add that he played a part which I have always wanted to play myself very much and have not yet succeeded in, in doing. Uh, he played, of course, who else but Captain Hook. The name of Karloff, I'm glad to say, is still very much with us in the person of his widow, Evie. Uh, Evie and I, over the years, starting, of course, during Boris's lifetime, have become, if I may say so, friends. And although I don't see her as much as I would like to, we always remember each other at Christmas time. Naturally, I asked her a lot of questions about Boris, and she very graciously answered them, and was very revealing indeed about a great many things I didn't know anything about. However, there is one particular remark that she made which will remain in my memory forever and ever because having read a good deal, as I obviously had about Boris, in books, in magazines, and so on and so forth, and you never quite know what to believe, I did ask her one day, Evie, are you Boris's fifth wife? And <laughs> Her answer, which, as I said earlier, is unforgettable, is, as far as I know. Now, Boris 
of course, was a great lover of sport. He was a great follower of rugby and frequently used to talk to me about various teams. In fact, he knew far more about it than I did. But his greatest love, of course, was typically, as an Englishman, cricket. Boris was at Uppingham. I believe he played for Uppingham. I'm not too sure about that, but I think he did. And I can't recall whether he just kept wicket or whether he was a batsman or a bowler, but he was a distinguished cricketer in his own way and, of course, formed a part of the legendary and unforgettable famous Hollywood cricket team, which went on for many, many years before the war and indeed during the war, uh, under the aegis and captaincy of that very formidable and very remarkable um, actor, the late Sir C. Aubrey Smith. Now, Aubrey Smith, of course, in his own way, was a very eminent and very distinguished cricketer also, but he certainly was an England captain. He also played for Sussex and was known as Round the Corner Smith because of his bowling style. He used to appear from behind the umpire. How a man of six foot four could disguise himself behind the figure of an umpire, I don't know, but he was known as Round the Corner Smith. Boris himself was a member of Surrey, and uh, the Surrey Cricket Club, of course, and indeed there are nets today at the Oval which are named after him. I used to go and watch cricket with him, not at the Oval, but at Lord's, and on many occasions Boris and I would sit and watch cricket from the pavilion. You can imagine some of the comments that were made by some of the other members, which we chose to ignore and gave over our entire attention to watching the game. Boris's comments and remarks during the game were extremely funny from time to time. Take him off, should never have been put on. I can play a better stroke than that. But this, of course, all stems from his days with Aubrey Smith, who was probably the most critical of all cricketers. And I think his comments were pretty amusing over the years, too. His appearance in This Is Your Life showed, I think, quite clearly to the many millions of people who watched it, what a gentle and warm-hearted man he was. The monster, or indeed as he or it should be correctly called, the creature, is so much a part now of Hollywood mythology that people are apt to think that Boris played it time and time and time again. In fact, of course, that was not the case at all. He put on this extraordinary and amazingly effective makeup three times on film. During the time that I got to know Boris and during the time that we worked together over the years, naturally, I, and I think understandably, used to ask him, well, not as many questions as I would have liked, but certainly quite a few. And they might have been about sport, they might have been about the world, they might have been about all sorts of things, but obviously from time to time, they were indeed about some of his legendary performances and some of the characters that he'd played. I just, quite simply, as a great admirer of his, and a friend, and another actor, wanted to know how some of these performances came about, and what he thought of them, and how he um, decided to play them, whether it was entirely something that came from his own mind, or whether it was a collaboration between him and the director, or whether it was already there in the script, etc., etc., which is standard, of course, for any film actor. But naturally, as I had, to a minor extent then, started to play some of the parts which he made so famous, uh, I did ask him questions about characters like the mummy, characters like the Frankenstein monster, and characters like Dr. Fu Manchu. I did ask him questions about these three characters, Fu Manchu, the mummy, and the Frankenstein, as it was called in those days, monster. Fu Manchu, well, we both decided that the most uh, uncomfortable and unpleasant part of that was, of course, the 
makeup, which had to be applied to the eyes in order to give the what they call the epicanthic fold, which is the fold on the inner eye, which gives you the oriental eye. So we didn't discuss that in any great detail. And I don't think by that time I'd played it anyway, but I had played Chinese. Then we got on to the question of the mummy. Now, I played that once, and he played it once. We both again decided that the major problem there was the makeup, and indeed the putting on of the clothing, if you can call it that. Yard after yard after yard of bandage and dust, and the patience that you needed as an actor, and indeed the patience that the makeup man needed. Uh, the mummy required Boris to be in the makeup chair, I think, for anything up to... Well, I don't... I'm, come to think of it, I don't think it was the chair. I think the whole point of this is that he kept on saying to me that he had to stand up while all this was done. Perhaps not the makeup on his face, but certainly the entire process of dressing him and making him up as the mummy took several hours. There's no question about that. And one of the reasons was, he told me there was an there was an effect of some sort in the film that he did where you see the mummy begin to breathe. And so you see over the area of the heart, the bandages slightly come open or split or crack. So therefore, they mustn't do that, of course, until the moment comes when the mummy comes back to life. I hope I'm explaining this adequately. And the consequently, he had to stand up all the time while these acres of bandage were put round him and then the makeup was put over them, which required enormous patience and physical stamina. The makeup on the face was also, I think, extremely well done. The makeup in Frankenstein, of course, that is one of the most famous makeups, if not the most famous makeup, probably in the history of the cinema. And I know what Boris went through on that. It took something like four and a half hours to make him up, facially and it took at least an hour and a half to get it off with the collodion and various other um, weapons, one might almost say. Bradley had to carve it off after plastering it on. The makeup, of course, was done by another legendary person in his own right, Jack Pierce. The difficulties that arose and the enormous demands that were made physically and mentally on the actor playing these parts how do you do it? How do you present the unbelievable to an audience which has got to believe? Some people have called it the momentary suspension of disbelief, a rather florid and somewhat profound phrase, but it's true. You have to make the audience stop believing during a period of time that what they're seeing can't happen, maybe. But what it boils down to, quite honestly, is that if you are playing one of those parts, and of course many others as well, there are certain elements which are essential. One, which he didn't tell me about, and which I soon discovered for myself, is what sad and pathetic beings these characters so frequently are, that they have not asked to be brought back to life, that they have not asked to be made immortal, that they have not asked uh, to deal death in all directions. It is something they can't control. And I think that's very important. So I always tried, and still would, if the occasion arose, to make the audience have a certain feeling of sympathy for the character, where appropriate, a certain sadness. I once referred to the loneliness of evil, and I still think that's appropriate to this day. Well, we didn't discuss that, but we did discuss the one obvious medium, and perhaps there are two, in which you can convey what you're trying to convey to the audience, and that is these, the eyes. Everything is in the eyes. And believe me, in film and on the cinema screen, and indeed on television, if you do not believe in what you are doing, and the last one sees this all too often, if you do not think about what you're saying, and if you do not listen to what other people are saying, or watch what they are doing, it shows in your eyes. 
So we did discuss the importance of using one's eyes because there was very little else that one could use. Also, the question of the bodily movements. With the Frankenstein monster, there was this ludicrous and in totally inaccurate impression given that he stumped about like a sort of colorless robot. In fact, in Boris's interpretation, it was nothing of the kind. The character was played, and rightly, somewhat like an unhappy child. And the movements were quick, abrupt, and one had an enormous sense of sympathy for this creature. And I felt that with this performance, which I think is still one of the greatest performances in the history of cinema, he achieved miracles with vocal effects, with bodily effects, but above all, in the eyes, even though they could only be seen, well, from time to time and not all that clearly, it was there. Now, there are two other elements that we discussed which I think are enormously important as well, and that I will come to. Boris told me, and he also told me that he had been told this by Lon Chaney, to whom he referred as the master, he told me something which I still repeat to people when appropriate. He said, when you are making a film of this kind, or really any film which is, let's say, melodramatic or peculiar or strange or occult or supernatural or unbelievable or incredible, whatever word you like to use, whatever adjective you wish to use, he said, when you are making a film of this kind and when you are playing a character within the framework of that story, he said, leave it to the imagination of the audience. That's so important. He then added that Cheney had said to him, and again he passed it on to me, because whatever we may be doing on the screen, if you don't do everything and you don't show everything, the audience will not only be much more affected by what they don't see rather than what they do see, but they will also think of something far, far worse than what we may possibly be doing up there on the screen. That applies today more than ever before, where in this kind of film, regrettably, everything is shown and practically nothing is suggested. Now, that was one thing he said to me. Again, another thing. So that's two things. The third thing, which has been very important in my life as an actor and was certainly immensely important in his, was quite simply this. An actor's vocation, craft, work, job, however you like to refer to it, is insecure, competitive, uncertain. It always was, it still is, it always will be. Boris said to me one day, what you must do, Christopher, is find something, some character or some sort of story, which no other actor can do or will do. If you find it, if you play it properly, if it's effective, you will have created something which is possibly unique, because we are all unique as individuals, but above all, you will make your mark all over the world. That is exactly what Boris Karloff did. He made a mark all over the world to such an extent that, like many of his characters, his name will never die. As far as I'm concerned, he's still very much with me. He intensely disliked the word horror. So do I. And I've said this on many occasions for the last 30 years. I don't feel it's an appropriate word. It's just something obscene and nasty. And none of the films that we did could possibly come under that heading. The word horror, I think, really came into being as a result of the different certificates given by the censor to films before the war. A for adult, U for universal, H for horror. I could be wrong here, but I think that's where it started. Uh, 
he didn't like that word. He didn't even want to mention it any more than I do. I firmly believe, like he did, the word is fantasy. If you like, also fairy story, morality play. You are not trying to frighten people quite literally out of their wits. You are not trying to sicken them. He never did. I never have. You are telling them a story. And you can entertain people quite simply in this kind of film without revolting them. I feel he was absolutely right in that area, and uh, I feel very strongly about that. I, I dislike the word myself also, and I've said so on many occasions, just as he did. Uh, you also have to remember another thing, and here I refer to the morality play, good always wins. Evil is almost invariably vanquished. I think this is also, in a moral sense, very important. I think the word macabre is a very good word too, which comes from the Arabic word actually, ma from kabr, the grave. Ma kabr. That's an appropriate word, isn't it? And um, he used to use that word too. When you come to think of it, some of the fairy stories that we were all brought up on as children are, if I may coin a pun, far more grim than many of the films that either Boris or I or any others made during our careers. Grim indeed. And uh, many fairy stories and many myths from many countries are far more horrifying and horrible than the films, which in my opinion have been incorrectly um, labeled with the word horror. There are two other qualities which Boris possessed to a very considerable degree that I have not up to now mentioned, but I'd like to tell you something about them. One was courage, sheer guts, and the other was humor, a sense of the ridiculous, a sense of fun. God knows uh, we used to have a lot of fun many years ago in the making of films, although the work was extremely hard, as it has always been. So much of that fun has gone out of films today, something I know that Boris would recognize and regret just as much as we all do. But to get to the first point, courage, or as I said, guts. For many years, Towards the end of his life, Boris was in intense and constant pain. As I think everybody knows, he had great difficulty in walking. He suffered from crippling arthritis and he had to wear a brace on one of his legs. He also then eventually began to suffer from emphysema and he had great difficulty in breathing. Now, the last time that I had the joy of working with Boris was in a film called The Curse of the Crimson Altar and the only reason I did it was because I wanted to be with Boris again in another film before he stopped working. And so the film was made. He was in a wheelchair the entire time, indoors and out, in bad weather, at night. He must have been feeling very ill, but his humor and his gallantry never deserted him. He kept us spellbound with his stories, myself especially, and he was always ready to laugh. And although the man physically was in a very bad way, when the director said action and the camera was turning over, 
It was like a resurrection. During the course of this film, he could barely walk, he could breathe only with great difficulty, and he couldn't stand. To me, that is true courage. Not courage from the heat of battle, but true courage. The kind that persists with every waking moment of every day. And Boris Karloff was an outstanding example of this. The second point I wanted to make was Boris's humor, his sense of the ridiculous, and his sense of fun. Now, everybody who knew him personally was very well aware of this. He was able to find something amusing in almost every kind of situation. Uh, I think uh, in some of the films that some of us have done over the years, we have also been placed in the same position and have had to find something amusing and I think uh, from time to time has succeeded in doing so in the rehearsals, I must emphasize. Uh, in this film, which I made with him in, I think, 1957 or 58, which was called originally The Doctor from Seven Dials and then retitled subtly for the American market uh, Corridors of Blood, Boris played a very noble, decent character, a doctor who was doing his best to alleviate the pain and suffering of the patients who came to him and who had to be operated on by the, because he wished to use anesthetics that would make them unconscious and he would be able to perform the operation without pain to the patient. I, needless to say, did not play an open and upright character at all. I played what was known in those days as a resurrectionist, in other words, somebody who actually found the bodies for the doctor to perform his experiments. I think the last major film of any consequence that Boris appeared in came very close to showing him, in a sense, as himself. Of course, he didn't play Boris Karloff. He did play a character who had become world famous through appearing in somewhat macabre and gruesome films. But he was, in a sense, very much himself, insofar as you can ever act yourself, which is virtually impossible. But I think the most memorable thing about that film, and there were many memorable things in it, as you will see for yourself, was this extraordinary story that he told. This extraordinary moment during the film when, to make a point, the actor, because he played an actor in this film, recounts this remarkable fable which probably goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Nobody who has seen that film will ever forget that, and I certainly won't. And I think that perhaps the telling of that story would, for me anyway, and I suppose for most people, be perfect swan song not necessarily for the life, but certainly for the career of the late, the great, and the very much lamented Boris Karloff.